that this panel discussion is jointly organized by these four institutions. And the purpose of this event and specifically this format is uh, 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 format is to initiate a multidisciplinary dialogue around this relatively lesser known subject. Most of us are aware of being Vedka because it is also a World Heritage Site, but that is not the only site and Lockhart sites are uh, found all around India. And there are multiple typologies uh, and uh, also the region specific problems with each of those typologies. So uh, we basically, and uh, you, some of you might be aware that just two weeks ago, another typology of rock art, also known as geoglyphs uh, from the Kokan region was also added to the tentative list of world heritage sites. So on this background, I'm hoping that this today's deliberation will bring forth the challenges, uh, challenges of interpretation and preservation of Indian rock art sites in its natural context. And probably we can also think about the possible management strategies. Um, today we have these subject ex experts with us who will introduce us to the multiple aspects of uh, the rock art. Dr. Pat Chohan is a prehistorian and comes from a very specific bran branch of uh, archaeology known as paleoanthropology. He is an assistant professor at Isar Mohali and he is known for his expertise in stone tool technology and symbolic, be symbolic human behavior. Today, he will talk about the rock art sites and their context, context in Indian prehistory. Uh, we also have Dr. Riza Abbas. He is an assistant director at Indian Numismatic uh, Historical and Cultural Foundation at Nashik. His area of expertise is the interpretation of rock art and uh, symbols. His book, uh, titled as Exploring the Rock Art of Chambal Basin, is considered as one of the important publications when it comes to Indian rock art research study. Uh, we also have Dr. Ashwin Kundalik with us today. He is an assistant professor at St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. Uh, by profession, he is a geologist and he is expert in sedimentology, structural geology, and metamorphic petro petrology. Uh, his interest is in application of geological knowledge in stone conservation. Uh, then we also have Aparna Vatwe, Dr. Aparna Vatwe. Uh, she has also joined us for this discussion today. Uh, she will focus on the uh, she will focus on the nature culture discourse and how it is essential to study these sites along with their natural context. She is a botanist and ecologist, and she is extremely active uh, on ground in preservation of biodiversity through community participation. And uh, finally, we also have Dr. Tejas Garge. So basically, he is the one who encouraged us to actually plan this sort of discussion on this forum, on the academic forum. Um, as most of you know that he is a director of state archaeology, but he is also an archaeologist and he is an expert uh, in Harappan civilization. Uh, this entire issue of Kokan geoglyphs have the present uh, attention and recognition that this, uh, the geoglyphs have received. It's mainly because of his efforts. So I welcome you all. And yeah, I, uh, also we have another archaeologist, Dr. Varad Sabnis. So he's our tutor for uh, the theory course titled Archaeological Studies. He is with, with us since last year and he's also with Goa State Archaeology. So on that note, I just once again welcome you all. And I would like to hand over the screen to our first speaker, Dr. Pat Chohan. Uh, and also please note that we will have this series of uh, series of uh, uh, presentations and after that we will open the floor for discussion and we really encourage all of you to share your thoughts and concerns at that point thank you over to, to you dr parth thank you murdala for the introduction um, i also thank the um, organizers and the co-host uh, for this event uh, i'll share my powerpoint now um, May I just request everyone to keep your mics on mute and uh, for whoever is possible, please keep your videos on, especially uh, MCR students. Is the full screen visible? Uh, yes, now it is visible. Okay, and the slide is changing? Yes, it is changing. Okay. So uh, the topic of my talk is basically introducing Indian prehistory and trying to contextualize uh, uh, Indian symbolic behavior uh, with some examples, uh, as well as talk about implications of recent studies uh, outside of India 
that have implications for understanding Indian rock art. And then at the end, I'll be talking a little bit about methodology and uh, broad issues. Um, so just to uh, cover the background, what's happening in uh, global paleoanthropological research uh, and how India is important for that. So we have basically new species continue to be discovered in Africa and Asia. Uh, we have stone tool technology now extending back to 3.3 million. Uh, earlier, it was 2.6 million. There's uh, various out of Africa dispersals, which are getting older uh, based on new sites, uh, including fossils, including stone tools uh, and ecological contexts. Uh, the lower to middle pillar transition now seems to be occurring at multiple locations across the old world between 500,000 and 300,000 years ago. Earlier, it was thought that this transition is mainly happening in Africa, and then everyone is uh, dispersing out multiple times in that time bracket. Homo sapiens is now older, from 200,000 to 300,000, and it's showing complex origins across Africa, possibly through multiple populations. And there's also evidence of multiple episodes of interbreeding uh, between species once it leaves Africa, including with um, uh, Neanderthals. And based on recent discoveries in Europe and Asia, uh, it seems that the Eurasian story of human evolution is vastly complex and different from Africa. Uh, once the earliest hominid populations established themselves um, in the beginning, then these populations follow their own trajectory. New technologies are innovated, uh, new species are coming up, and other species are going extinct. Now, why is India important or the subcontinent? It's located in the center of the old world, linking the records of Africa, Europe, and Eastern Asia. It has a very lengthy research history in Stone Age studies from late 1800 onwards, which is roughly the same time stone tools were discovered in Europe. Uh, and there's evidence of continuous human occupation from 1.5 million years onwards, and maybe even earlier, around 2 million years. So you can see it's very important geographically uh, and because of other evidences such as extinct animals, uh, impact of humans in the landscape and social interactions with surrounding populations. The region also has a very high ethnic, cultural, genetic and linguistic diversity. Uh, there's a vast uh, number of tribal populations or hunter-gatherer populations uh, adapted to different ecozones and different uh, subsistence strategies. Now, just a quick overview of stone tool technology. Um, now, even though it's called the Stone Age, uh, they were using other materials such as wood and bone, um, antler, ivory maybe, but stone tools have survived the geological record. So hence it's called the Stone Age. The oldest technology is 3.3 million years old, but in India, we don't have this. In fact, this only comes from one site in Africa so far. Um, the older one evidence, uh, which is found in China and Europe and other places, is currently ambiguous in the subcontinent. We don't have any clear evidence of older one occupation. Uh, there possibly is evidence from uh, the Shivaliks uh, through stone tools or uh, cut mark bones, but these are very equivocal. Uh, and then we have the earliest evidence of Acheulean which is 1.5 million, the oldest outside of Africa. And that continues until 120,000 years ago in terms of large flake Acheulean. And then we have middle Paleolithic, which seems to have multiple origins across the old world. And the Indian uh, or South Asian age bracket is 400,000 to about 40,000. The upper Paleolithic is very poorly known. And I'll be talking about that separately in a later slide. And micro the technology, um, which follows upper Paleolithic, but also overlaps with it, is uh, around 50,000 years old. And this technology also continues very late. Um, and I'll be talking about that separately. This is the only known non-homo sapien fossil uh, from South Asia coming from central India. Um, and the taxonomic identity is debated uh, because it's a partial cranium. We don't have any diagnostic features, and, but we know it's not homo sapiens. And it comes from a secondary deposit with vertebrate fossils of mixed ages. So the exact age of this specimen remains uncertain. It might be late Pleistocene age or middle Pleistocene age. It's not clear, but we need more fossils. The fossil record for Homo sapiens is 40,000 and younger from India and Sri Lanka. Now, I just wanna highlight that various other species were known in uh, Asia and Europe uh, once these older populations become settled uh, or established uh, leaving, after leaving Africa. We have Denisovans, we have the Red Deer Cave people, we have the Neanderthals, and Homo floresiensis in Southeast Asia. 
And we also have other species, for example, in Philippines and other locations, but not all these species were widespread. Some of them are widespread geographically, like Denisovans and Neanderthals, but others like Floresiensis were restricted to specific ecozones, uh, such as Southeast Asia or Eastern Asia um, in certain pockets when they're isolated geographically. But this has implications for South Asia because we have no fossil record and we don't know which species was present here before Homo sapiens. Uh, it's important to know this because we have to understand how these populations became uh, replaced by Homo sapiens gradually. Now, the broad global role of India in just a series of broad questions. Uh, we don't know if old one hominins reach India or pass through India. How many actually in dispersals there were into India and out of India? Did hominins or technologies dispersed uh, to Central Asia or Southeast Asia from the subcontinent? At the moment, we don't have evidence of Paleolithic occupation in Northeast India. So maybe the region was not used as a corridor, but again, more research is required and uh, there's a lot of potential. We also don't know the timings and nature of technological transitions, whether they're indigenous innovations or incoming dispersals or a combination of the two. Also, what is the age and nature of symbolic behavior? And I'll be defining symbolic behavior later. How did hominids adapt to India's ecological climate diversity, including the prominent monsoon? And were humans responsible for any animal extinctions, including, for example, hippo and ostrich? Now, one problem with using archaeology uh, to identify species is that there's a huge diversity. Sometimes different hominid species have been known to use the same technology. And sometimes one hominid species across a large area has been known to use different technologies. So the archeology span is not reliable to identify uh, which species was present, except for the microliths and maybe the upper paleolithic, which can be assigned to Homo sapiens. But older technologies could have been made by a range of species. Now, trying to understand uh, the arrival of Homo sapiens based on the archeology, span based on the genetics and based on fossil evidence. The fossil evidence suggests an arrival around 40,000 years ago based on the oldest fossils in Sri Lanka. And then DNA of modern tribals suggests an arrival of 60,000 years ago. Uh, but it's possible that older populations, if they arrived but did not survive, then the genetic legacy would not have been passed on. So the genetic evidence is a bit restricted or limited. The microlithic evidence is about 48,000 years old from central India and Sri Lanka. And then we have a younger middle paleolithic which is ranging from 114,000 years to 77,000 years. And all of this young evidence has been associated with Homo sapiens based on technological similarities with evidence in Africa. But now, uh, a few years ago, we had an older Middle Paleolithic reported from South India, which suggests that there's a long uh, history of Middle Paleolithic occupation, including uh, change within the technology. So it's not clear if the younger evidence was made by Homo sapiens or archaic populations or maybe uh, different species made this technology over time. Now, the upper paleolithic is enigmatic uh, compared to the other technologies because of these reasons. First of all, we know that it's uh, made up of landmark technology, larger than microliths. It overlaps with the middle paleolithic and it overlaps with the microlithic. Um, and only two or three sites have been dated properly, including site 55 in Pakistan and 16 Ardun in Rajasthan. And the dates range around 45,000 or 40,000, uh, but we don't know exactly the earliest occurrences and the youngest occurrences. Most sites in India are undated and poorly understood, and they're geographically variable and missing in many places. So the distribution of this technology is very uneven uh, and ambiguous. It's probably related to raw material acquisition or availability and subsistence behaviors. And because of all these problems, lack of dates, uh, lack of enough knowledge, the current association with paintings remains tenuous. So we should be very cautious, uh, cautious about associating uh, some paintings with Upper Paleolithic. Of course, our knowledge of Upper Paleolithic has also changed in the last few decades. Now the same thing with the microliths. We don't know if it was innovated in India or introduced from outside, or maybe a combination of both. We have the earliest occurrences around 48,000 in central India from sites such as Dhaba and Metakheri and also uh, Fahi and Lena Cave in Sri Lanka. So these are broadly contemporary sites and it's possible that older sites exist uh, out there. Um, several sites have transitional sequences but remain undated. So we don't know the nature of uh, change and the timing of change from Upper Paleolithic uh, to the Mesolithic uh, at sites such as Bimbertka and Patne and many other locations. 
The technology continues well into historical times and possibly even into colonial times. But this needs to be confirmed through dating and even through ethnoarchaeology uh, and extensive uh, surveys and ge geomorphological investigations. Now coming to the symbolic behavior, um, what is symbolic behavior? Basically any behavior that was practiced beyond uh, subsistence purpose or survival purpose. Now, one example of symbolic behavior can be human burials. The oldest evidence of burials comes from uh, Neanderthal sites and later on uh, Homo sapiens sites. Uh, there's also a possibility that Homo naledi disposed of their dead in a specific manner, but this is controversial at the moment. Um, but this counts as symbolic behavior in addition to other uh, evidences I'll show you. For example, we have uh, found quartz crystals at an Ashulian site in Rajasthan, a singular love. This might also represent symbolic behavior. It's not necessarily that they're using uh, quartz for daily uh, purpose or some functional purposes. It's possible that there was some special meaning attached to these uh, kind of crystals. These kind of crystals are not found at most uh, lower Paleolithic or younger sites. Uh, these kind of evidences usually uh, appear in the Mesolithic or Upper Paleolithic uh, at other sites in other regions outside of India. And then other evidence of symbolic use of ochre. Uh, the use of ochre starts very early, especially in Africa, around 300,000 years ago, uh, in terms of long distance transport, uh, use of uh, ochre in symbolic manner. In this case, these evidences are coming from Southern Africa with engravings uh, in a geometric pattern, then the use of ochre on stone pieces, and then uh, ochre found in shell. So this is again, another type of uh, symbolic behavior going beyond uh, rock art and sometimes connected with rock art. Another example is uh, engraved ostrich eggshells. Uh, and what is unique is that we only have one specimen from India, from Bhatne, but we have several hundred specimens from other sites, uh, for example, in uh, various locations in Africa. And this is probably due to preservation bias and not necessarily the lack of symbolic behavior uh, in South Asia. We need to carry out more surveys and find out uh, the exact frequency, density, and location. And of course, many of people are familiar with this kind of symbolic behavior in terms of figurines uh, and other artwork, uh, the Venus figurines from Europe, and then the ivory figurine on the bottom left, and the uh, uh, lion man also coming from Europe. So all of these are found, one reason is because of excellent preservation in cave sites, uh, research bias, you know, continuous research, uh, going on for over a century in these zones. So we don't know if the South Asian region has these kind of evidences, but more research is required and there's potential of finding similar things. The other possibility is that this evidence was there, but did not get preserved. Then coming to the oldest known paintings, these are coming from Spain, but again, very controversial. Uh, the dating method has been challenged. And also if the dating has been challenged, then the Neanderthal affinity is also indirectly affected. At the moment, almost all paintings known in Europe belong to Homo sapiens. But if this is uh, uh, legitimate, then it suggests that other species were also painting. Um, again, we need more sites, uh, more evidences. So we need the same, the same concept applies in India. It's possible that some paintings were made by other species and not all by Homo sapiens. The most, uh, uh, accepted evidence, non-controversial, and the oldest rock paintings in the world are about 45,000 years old, recently reported from Sulawesi in Southeast Asia. And this has major implications for India because if these populations had knowledge of painting and they passed through the subcontinent to get to Southeast Asia, then we have possibly older paintings in the Indian subcontinent. But again, we don't know the route they took, uh, whether it was through Central Asia or through the subcontinent and whether they had the knowledge of painting uh, while they were dispersing uh, out of Africa, or did they develop the, this knowledge uh, on their own uh, independently? Now, just a quick summary of the Indian rock art. Uh, They're found in the form of pictograms, petroglyphs, copula marks, uh, engravings, paintings, uh, and a combination of these. Majority of them come from central India and southern India, uh, and other pockets. But you can see on this map, for example, uh, the dis distribution is very uneven. And it also depends on geology. For example, if suitable surfaces were available for painting or engraving. 
And there's also a dichotomy in terms of uh, the locations of the paintings and the location of the engravings, uh, depending on uh, research history, of course, and uh, the preservation. In some cases, there might've been older paintings existing some places, but uh, the preservation is affecting the visibility, for example, or some regions are inaccessible uh, because of political issues and socioeconomic issues. And based on compilation, uh, it shows that animal figures were very popular uh, at the subcontinental level, followed by um, hunting scenes, and then followed by human figurines. All other scenes occur much less, but this is just a very rough uh, count based on publications. As we get more data and have a database in the future, uh, a lot of these numbers are going to change uh, and there are gonna be some regional patterns. For example, animal figures might be imported in central India, but not uh, Southern India, for example. So what we don't know about Indian rock art, uh, we don't have the ages. We don't have absolute ages from many sites. Some paintings have been dated in central India to within the Holocene. Uh, some engravings have been dated to about uh, 4,500 years old uh, from, from Andhra Pradesh, but we don't have dates for most of these paintings. And if the oldest ones are faded, then we'll never know when painting started. We don't know the nature of appearance, whether it was innovated in South Asia or introduced by incoming populations. What were the factors and speed or regional diversity? How did art, the, the concept of art and the production of art spread across the subcontinent? We don't have evidence of this. Also, unlike Africa, why didn't they take ostrich eggshell fragments across the uh, subcontinent with them? Uh, the, this evidence from geochemical uh, evidence in Africa shows long distance exchange networks uh, and social interactions based on ostrich eggshell beads. But we don't have any evidence of ostrich uh, eggshell beads or engraved specimens being found outside the ostrich zone in, in South Asia. Maybe it's a lack of research or lack of preservation uh, or visibility issues, but this needs to be investigated. Also the precise functions of all paintings from different periods is not clear. Uh, not all of them could have been art. They would have had different purposes, what functions they played, what roles they played, uh, in the past at different locations. Also the cultural identity at two levels. One is the cultural identity of painters. For example, were all paintings made by tribals only or later on were they made by farmers uh, and uh, urban occupants, for example, or people passing through. Uh, and also the biological identity of the painters. What species uh, made all of these paintings? Of course, the vast majority probably belong to homo sapiens, but it's possible that some of the oldest ones might've been made by uh, archaic species before Homo sapiens arrives, or even after Homo sapiens arrives. The missing evidence of rock shelters. Based on the known evidence, what we should expect, uh, we're not finding, for example. There's lack of paintings closer to the ground, suggesting that children were not painting, but this could be a misleading uh, evidence. In some, in some sites, we do have evidence of uh, possible paintings by children. Also, it's not clear which subjects are not represented or minimally represented in paintings and why. For example, if they were exploiting uh, ostrich eggshells for food and engraving and making beads, why don't we find more paintings of ostriches? Why don't we find more paintings of lions or hippos or squirrels, for example? And there's other missing uh, materials as well, or maybe it's because of research bias and visibility, such as engraved ochre fragments from like, no, as known from Africa, I showed you earlier, uh, human remains, uh, you know, burials inside the rock shelters and caves, the presence of heavy duty tools and not just microliths, and also the lack of very rich scatters associated with rock paintings. So just a quick uh, information about methodology. Uh, I'm proposing that we change our approach in terms of classification of painting styles. Now, uh, most uh, terms that are used are such as upper paleolithic, mesolithic, neolithic, and chalicolithic, and historical based on the painting styles and overlap. Now, the reason I'm proposing not to do so in changing it to a more neutral uh, method is that we have no absolute dates for any of the paintings. So we don't know how old they are. We don't know which ones are younger, which ones are older. We have no quantified or abundant occurrences of consistently overlapping patterns. Overlapping has been, or superimposition has been reported, but there's no quantification or statistical analysis of this evidence. These labels are largely based on assumptions or stylistic differences, skill levels, and complexity over time. And another possibility that we can use 
is uh, just use neutral terms uh, or formats such as style A, style B, style C, and style D instead of the cultural, uh, chronocultural terms. It removes the chronological tag and this method is more objective. Here's an example. If you have a deer painting that is presumably Mesolithic, which is covered by another painting, which is presumably Neolithic. And finally, we have a human figure, which is presumably Chalcolithic, all of them different colors and superimposed. It's possible that the uh, blue figure and the red figure are younger. It's not necessary that they're actually Mesolithic age. It's possible that they're Chalcolithic age or historical age. And I'm saying this because uh, tribal populations could have copied older styles and older styles could have continued uh, to be made uh, repeatedly into colonial times or historical times. So we'd be very cautious about how we classify these paintings. And uh, just- uh, uh, Professor Park, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt, just a reminder about time. Yeah, I'm almost mm -hmm. finished. So uh, this is an example of U-series dating, uh, which can be applied to South Asian art. Uh, this study actually identified several paintings within the Holocene and they were able to correlate it with specific environmental events in the region. Then we have experimental approach and using biometric analysis to look at the hand stencils. And this can be used to identify uh, gender, for example, uh, identify age of the makers. Uh, these hand stencils uh, identified infants, children, and juveniles. And other similar studies using geometric morphometrics reveal the dominance of female hand stencils instead of male hand stencils. And geometric morphometrics have also been used to identify uh, or, or clarify certain information about species of animals. This can be used in India, uh, especially for the most confusing or ambiguous figures, which have been debated upon. And finally, uh, quick priorities that need to be uh, focused on is preservation and conservation, which my colleagues will talk about in more detail. One thing is, can we preserve some of these paintings in a better way? Besides documentation, can we physically preserve them in a longer, in a better way uh, for long-term preservation? Uh, we need to date a lot of these uh, uh, paintings before the pigments uh, get destroyed or disappear. We need to possibly uh, close off original sites, which are very important and maybe build replicas for the public so we can avoid things like graffiti and vandalism and uh, natural elements affecting the preservation. And we also can, can focus on widespread documentation of all rock painting sites at a regional level uh, using various uh, methods. For example, 3D laser scanning, uh, photography, uh, GPS and GIS mapping, for example. And this can be done through a network of researchers uh, across the subcontinent. We also need to survey for, uh, for new sites and carry out excavations of well stratified shelters and see if we can decolonize the historical interpretations, uh, especially the colonial interpretations, uh, and see if, how we can move forward uh, by uh, looking at these paintings and these engravings and other symbolic behavior from multidisciplinary perspectives using modern methods. And finally, uh, just to highlight this uh, recent development in uh, Australia, the Australian government actually now banned uh, tourists from climbing this rock. And this rock, Uluru, uh, is basically sacred for the indigenous uh, Aborigines of Australia. So this is giving a, giving an example of how it has implications for conducting research in India. We need to think about the ethics in Indian rock art research. For example, uh, sacred sites need to be respected. Uh, some site access may require permission of local residents and cooperation. Uh, regional indigenous groups should be more involved, in my opinion, as stakeholders in their own heritage, not just in preservation, but in other ways, for example. Uh, while they're often hired for finding and documenting sites, they're rarely encouraged or helped to pursue formal academic training and are almost never involved in subsequent study, interpretation, or publication of the rock art. I think we need to involve them more uh, in the long run in our projects. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Prath. And uh, sorry to interrupt you in between. That's okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Riza. Uh, Pat, sir, you will have to yes. stop sharing. Yes, sir. Yeah. yes, yes. I will share your presentation. Yeah. 
Uh, is it visible on full screen mode? Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all today. As our primary audience is uh, master's students, so I therefore want to first define Rob. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, the term rock art uh, denotes in the strict sense any sort of artistic manifestations or markings occurring on rocky surfaces. So, and uh, of course, it's a global phenomena and uh, uh, it's uh, one of the many aspects of human creativity uh, and cultural activities which has survived and is av available to us. They basically occur in two forms, as Dr. Chauhan has already actually uh, given you an idea about uh, rock art. So I'm just uh, pointing out that uh, it, it occurs in form of pictograms and petroglyphs. So I have already defined it on the slide. You can see it. Next, please. So uh, before we start, uh, a few words on symbolism. Because since rock art is a symbolic behavior, so I think I should uh, point this symbolic behavior here. So what is symbolism? Uh, in a visible form, symbolism is representation of ideas, beliefs, actions, and events, etc., or transcendent realities, uh, which brings the observer into connection with the participation. A symbol can be sensed and given an absolute and exclusive meaning which is accepted and understandable in a particular culture. For every symbol, uh, there is a context, time, place, reference that gives meaning to it. And uh, all these symbols, they stand for something, but it also has a larger and more complex meaning, which at times is abstract. In other words, it may, be, it may represent an unseen thing also, so uh, symbols can be used to signify or give meaning to an object, idea, event, or relationship. And hence, it can be defined as a symbol always forms an image uh, which has a meaning. And that image is, uh, that transfer of image takes place on some medium to communicate uh, either within the real world or within the unseen. So hence, it is related to perception of some sort of reality which is shared or communicated through different mediums. In both the cases, it has an inherent meaning, uh, which is, of course, culture specific. Now, what is art? Next, please. Yeah. So art is a symbolic communicative behavior, uh, which is actually only practiced by humans. It is generally believed that, rock, uh, that this art has evolved concurrently with other cultural traits such as language, symbolism, self-consciousness, neural coordination, uh, neural evolution, and hence it becomes uh, an important source to understand the beginning of human intellect and ability of human species to produce abstractions of reality. Next, please. So uh, now, rock art. What is rock art? So I have already defined it, but uh, like uh, uh, the early artistic abilities of man across the world are preserved on the hard and solid surfaces termed as rock art. Rock art is a global phenomena, and uh, this creative genius of the prehistoric man actually is manifested in almost every part of the world in different techniques, in different styles, reflecting different themes, specific to different cultural periods. Rock art is one of the many aspects of creativity and cultural activities, uh, which has survived and is available to us. Bernerick defines rock art as an artistic manifestation or markings that were intentionally produced by human beings on a rocky surface. Next, please. So uh, this art form is generally manifested inside walls, ceilings of rock shelters, uh, large overhangs, caves, caverns, as well as surface of large boulders and many a times on a bedrock or in an open area. Next, please. Uh, 
it is found in uh, basically uh, two forms. One is that iconic and the other one is non-iconic. You can see in the slide. And then it has uh, like, uh, it is uh, created using different techniques. Some are additive techniques called pictograms uh, that includes paintings, drawings, prints, stencils. Uh, and the other one is by reductive technique called petroglyphs that includes engravings, bruisings, carvings, etc. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, one second. I think it uh, it's not happening. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, as far as the time frame is concerned, Dr. Chauhan has already shown these quartz crystal. So, we have a very meager amount of data that is recovered from the subcontinent that can be termed as value art. And uh, some examples are, of course, from the Dwana. Uh, some are from uh, Bimitka. And uh, Hosni Valley also gave uh, some earliest evidence of manifolds and exotic or novel objects uh, uh, in form of faceted hematite nodules. So these are all, these all show some sort of symbolic behavior among the, uh, the uh, prehistoric man. Uh, now, like, uh, next, please. Uh, within this uh, uh, Paleolithic art, or you can say the art of the, uh, uh, the Pleistocene period, uh, we also have other evidences. Uh, of course, the finding of that, uh, that Nohana Nala is not uh, uh, an art object, but it shows that India was having a very advanced bone industry. Uh, uh, and uh, due to paucity of uh, such finds, uh, we don't have much data available to us. And uh, other than this, we have uh, uh, examples from uh, Partney uh, in the form of this uh, beads, uh, shell beads, ostrich actual beads. And of course, uh, some examples are in the form of the, uh, uh, the grooved and antique from Karnul Caves. Um, next, please. So other than this, we also have some uh, symbolic behavior uh, on ostrich actions in form of ostrich action beads that uh, you can see on uh, this slide. Next, please. Uh, during the Holocene period, we don't have uh, uh, much uh, art objects, mobile art objects, except for the finding of this Chandravati uh, in Great Gold. But uh, we do have uh, some examples like uh, we have a very advanced. Uh, painting uh, tradition uh, that belongs to Mesolithic period, and you can see. This, I'm not going to uh, like narrate everything about this uh, tradition, but like you can see. Slide like, next, please. This is the rock art of Neolithic and Chalithic period. Just to give an overview. Next, please. Uh, in megalithic context also, we get lots of uh, uh, artistic manifestations and uh, basically like in Vidarbha area and uh, some other parts of uh, like in Karnataka or South India, we also get cup marks that can be termed as uh, some sort of symbolic behavior, which is unknown to us. Next, please. Yeah, so this is uh, some of the depictions of early historic period. Next, please. This is the distribution map of Indian Roma, where like, uh, it has been divided into various zones. Next, please. Now comes to uh, significance of rock art. Why this uh, art is important? Why study rock art? So creating visual art is uh, one of the defining characteristics of human species. I've already uh, indicated this, but the positive of archeological evidence 
means that we have a limited information on the origin and evolution of this aspect of human culture. Draw art across the world is a, a large corpus of symbolism, visual record, and a major component of world art, art history, which is embedded in cultural landscapes and reflects the uh, different stages of uh, cultural development of mankind, as well as uh, earliest forms of human cognition, mental abilities, and artistic merit of prehistoric societies. In a way, it is a universal expression of communication of human thoughts and reflects a thought process of humans to a changing environment, actually, and uh, culture. And a form of symbolic behavior related to perception of some sort of reality, which was shared and communicated on that rocky surface. Uh, and of course, it is uh, a remarkable and broken artistic tradition that covers a period of uh, about 300,000 years. So this, if we take a couple of marks into this, so we have some examples, uh, we date back to uh, 300,000 years in India also and elsewhere also in form of cup marks. So this valuable record is used in re reconstructing the life ways of primordial societies as no other archaeological source is as informative as rock art. And at the same time, uh, the material record of the distant past that also gives an, an idea of faunal species, aspects of ceremony, belief, uh, and history are recorded in visual form. So most of these rock art sites and these uh, depictions, these manifestations, uh, they are a testament uh, to thousands of years of indigenous culture and uh, cultural interaction with other peoples, other creatures, and uh, other and in different environments. And in most cases, uh, these beliefs are no longer uh, practiced and the art uh, is the only evidence uh, of their existence. Uh, and uh, once it is damaged, it cannot be uh, recreated. So throughout the world, rock art is the most important visual record of uh, humanity's ancient past, which is uh, really very important. Uh, next, please. So, there is a general belief that uh, the rock art has evolved simultaneously with other cultural traits of human uh, humanity, such as language, symbolism, self consciousness, neural evolution, and human constructs of reality. All these faculties are closely associated with the origins of human cognition and intellect, uh, as well as development of our ontologies. Rock art becomes important to understand the origin of language, human consciousness, mental processes, behavior, uh, and uh, cognitive and intellectual world of the past, uh, which uh, are otherwise inaccessible to us. Uh, in determining, it is also important in determining how our species acquired the concepts of reality and started produ producing abstraction. This is very important. Next, please. So what we know about this artistic behavior, we don't have uh, much, many scientific studies pertaining to this, but whatever we know about uh, this uh, art is that the biological theories, they link art with the mating and uh, strategies, uh, the mating strategies in animal world, whereas the evolutionary theory links the symbolic nature of art to critical uh, pivotal brain changes in Homo sapiens, supporting increased development of language and hierarchical social grouping collectively. And these theories point to art as a multi process cognition dependent on diverse brain region. Research also suggests that the cognitive mechanism necessary for the development of cave and rock art are likely to be analogous with, the, uh, with uh, those that are employed in the expression of the symbolic thinking required for language. Next, please. So this I have already narrated to you. Next, please. Next, please. 
So there are many theories actually regarding the function and meaning of rock art. Uh, but uh, it's really hard to define rock art in a single concept. Uh, at the same time, we should also understand that uh, there is always a purpose behind manifesting rock art, uh, whether it is an iconic form or a non-iconic form. The motive can be many. There, this can be many. It can be appreciation. It can be expression. It can be ritualistic. It can be uh, it can be contemplative. It can be observational, cosmological, astronomical. So many theories have been placed. Therapeutic use, magical. Uh, uh, religious function and all these things. So regarding the meaning and function of rock art, several theories have been explained and uh, some uh, theories also points towards the model of shrine, archaeoastronomy, trademarkings, uh, puberty and other communal rights, uh, territory and trademarks, uh, all those things. So, but like recently, uh, some uh, empirical data is available as far as this uh, the, the giving explanation to rock art, rock art is concerned. And uh, one is the numerous archaeological model proposed by Lewis William and Thomas Dawson. So they emphasize on the neuropsychology for the ethnographically informed uh, interpretations of rock art. Uh, it is also proposed that rock art images symbolizes uh, certain natural and supernatural realms, uh, or they are used as devices to trigger memory and narrative accounts. These symbols were metaphors for rituals, uh, rituals, uh, as well as uh, some were abstractions for real and unreal, seen and unseen. It is also argued that the repeated use of similar symbols and design points towards some meaningful exemplification of. Uh, the inscriber adhering to a ritual or ideological observance and protocols rather than artistic endeavors. The studies in this context have shown that without understanding the cultural processes, it is really very hard to understand the intended meaning of an abstract and a representational symbology of rock art. Richard Bradley uh, inter interprets rock art as a symbolic message that are shared between artifacts and natural places in the lands. He discusses the cultural setting of uh, the rock carvings and the ways in which they can be interpreted in relation to ancient land use. Uh, with this, uh, we have lots of challenges also. Next please. Next please. Uh, Dr. Riza, can I remind yeah. you about the time? Okay, I will have to put you. Yeah, please, next please. So, next please. Next slide. This I already yeah, explained. Yeah. yeah, I think this is again stuck. Sorry. Uh, let me reshare. So now uh, the challenges. Uh, the challenges of empirical understandings are there in rock art. As a, as a, uh, as we know that uh, this can be uh, categorized as one of the most enigmatic and abstruse uh, cultural con constructs of mankind whose many uh, full interpretation with empirical understanding is yet to be ascertained. So unfortunately, at one side, it is heavily encompassed with the problems of understanding, whereas on the other side, the universals and the similarities in the content, style, subject matter, points towards a codified and shared set of symbols that might be assumed as a medium uh, of goal-oriented communication, which is yet to be successfully comprehended. The universality of some of the symbols, such as many of the geometrical forms occurring in rock art world, makes rock art symbology really very interesting. And at the same time, uh, it can be also seen used with some main, same meaning across the globe, irrespective of uh, cultural, territorial, and geographical back, uh, boundaries. The other problems with the art are uh, from are related to the origin and evolution, use and discontinuation, and resurrection of certain symbols at one point of time in different areas or at different point of time in the same areas. Decoding the meaning is a major challenge since most of the societies that practice rock art now are no extent and has transformed into a culture. Uh, that no, uh, that is no more. Uh, that no more uh, practices rock art. 
the difference in time frame does not allow us uh, to make meaningful conjectures related to understanding of this form of art because neither uh, there is a continuity nor there is any written record to, tra to trace the symbolic meaning. So in my opinion, uh, like most of the pre-modern societies quest for altered perceptions or the visions from the spiritual realms to impart knowledge and experience of the unseen and mythical landscape was always attempted by certain members of a society for certain sociocultural reasons. Uh, the perception and beliefs of these pre-modern societies uh, were obviously different from the present society and to understand these perceptions, we have to piece together whatever information is available to us. However, it is really uh, difficult it is a difficult task to understand and propound the symbolic delineations of uh, those symbols which were used as metaphors to define a process, or event, or a relationship. Uh, now, the only thing we can say that these culturally shared symbolic messages played a very vital role in, uh, in integrating the life ways of our ancestors, and at the same time, they were used as uh, for communication, for sharing thought, whether it is devised for some aesthetic purpose or just for communication or interaction with the, uh, which was uh, interaction which was purposeful. So with many theories and interpretations, rock art remains elusive and apparently uh, preserves its aesthetic value and its valuable work of art, both in terms of originality and archaeism. All this makes rock art, specifically its motives and symbols, as one of the most enigmatic uh, uh, and at the same time captivating cultural constructs of humans whose meaning is deeply rooted in the world views and mental processes of those bygone societies. So now it's like since I don't know whether time will permit me to go through some more uh, Okay, then. Uh, can we, uh, that, uh, yeah, maybe uh, we can. Yes, we can discuss. Uh, yeah, we can come back to it uh, yeah. if, during discussion session. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for covering such a, a vast topic in short time span. Uh, so, Dr. Ashwin, uh, are you there? Yes. Uh, shall I share my screen? Yes, please. Yeah. So I think some of us joined late. So just for, I think, their reference, Dr. Ashwin is a geologist and he is with uh, St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. And today he will talk about, uh, he will talk about the entire geological perspective and his interest is in actually how the geological knowledge can be used for conservation purposes. So over to you, Dr. Ashwin. Thank you. And uh, I just uh, like to quickly appreciate and uh, thank the organizers for this event. And it is absolutely an honor to be uh, with, with all the stalwarts in the field. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is, is, is entirely a geologist's perspective about this. And uh, basically when it comes to the conservation and when we are talking about preserving these, these rock art sites, uh, the first important thing about, about these rock art sites and any, any conservation and preservation is a detailed documentation. And uh, as, as Dr. Abbas has mentioned just now, that the scientific documentation is, is almost missing from, from, the, from the Indian uh, conservation perspective. So geology forms the basis of all of this because uh, since most of the, or all of the rock art sites are having a significant geological substrate. And it becomes very important to understand them from, from a, a geologist's perspective. So when we look at, at the overall distribution of such sites in India, uh, we have a very, very diverse physiography. And as we can, as we can see in this map, we have, we have the lofty mountain chains uh, from, from the Himalayas. And there are rock art sites also in, in the Uttarakhand Himalayas. Then we have, we have the plains, the alluvial plains of, of Ganga and, and the and Thar Desert. 
we have aravalli mountain chains then we have we have the narmada graben and the vindhans and and the satpura mountain chains we have deccan plateau saurashtra plateau the ghat sections the the eastern ghat and the western ghats and the northeastern arakan yuma hill ranges the plateau of shillong which has also provided a lot of lot of sites so india is is a diverse country in in terms of its geology in terms of its its geomorphology and it is very important to understand this to understand its bearing on the presence of of these sites uh, first of all because these are the sites and overall if we look at look at the look at the human occupation of of india it is largely controlled by the physiography perspective and if we look at at the rock shelters if we look at the sites where the rock paintings are are there all of them are controlled by by this physiographic perspective so first thing to understand is is this and when we look at the physiography the even even fundamental cause behind this physiological makeup of india is its geology and uh, what i'm showing you is is the rough geological map of india even you know it is uh it is very very generalized what we can see over here is we are going to see a general geological background of the indian indian subcontinent indian geology is is very diverse uh, in terms of geochronology uh, in terms of the rock characteristics in terms of the structures um indian geology plays a very vital role in understanding the earth's past so that is that is one thing about the indian geology and it also helps to understand the prehistory because because the alluvia of of the rivers like like narmada or or the ancient alluvia like shivaliks they have offered a lot of perspectives on the past climate change uh, they have offered a lot of perspectives on the human evolution and uh, based on the stone tools and based on the fossils that were found in this uh, in these alluvia uh, a lot of advancements have 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 been achieved in that field and uh, so that is that is one contribution and when we look at this it covers a very 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 wide spectrum of the rocks covers a very wide spectrum of the geological ages it covers a very wide spectrum of the rock textures and when we try to understand this and when we try to conserve and preserve the rock art sites it becomes absolutely essential to have a background information on geology because it is important to understand how the rocks behave we are we are going to look at that in in a little bit of details in in the coming few slides but behavior of the rock behavior of of the painted surface on them is entirely controlled by 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 their composition and and the texture so when we are trying to understand this and when we are trying to to look at at the rock arts uh, made be petroglyphs made be made be rock paintings it is absolutely essential to understand the surface behind them and uh, it is absolutely essential to use and plan the conservation strategy uh, by looking at 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 the rocks so let us take a look at the geological background and the rock art sites that we have what i have done is is a bit of simplification of the previous map over here what we can see is is a very generalized timeline of the indian geology and as we can see it it starts from from the old some of the oldest rocks in the world so something around around 4 4.2 billion years is is the oldest rock unit found in india that is in odisha and we can see that that these rocks like granites or or the granite gneisses or the metamorphic rocks in general we have schists we have marbles you have quartzites and and many other like granulites they are present in 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 this triangular portion of of india we call that as the indian shield then we have we have another terrain which consists of high grade metamorphic rocks which are called as as the proterozoic or or they are called as the mobile belts which we can see in in the in the eastern ghats or we can see them in in the on the southern fringe of the narmada valley in the aravalli ranges um the proterozoic the old sandstones and and the limestones and conglomerates they are present in in kadappa 
they are present in southern parts of, of the Maharashtra, northern parts of Karnataka. The Bhimbetka site is, is over here and it is present in the Vindhyan sandstones. And those Vindhyan sandstones belong to this time span, the Proterozoic II, so 1800 to 541. There are few sites which have been uh, found in, in the Pranita Godavari uh, Valley. And uh, those were the sites, again, again, they, in, they are present in, in the Proterozoic rocks. Then there are rock art sites which are present in Kerala. Uh, we, are, we are going to see those examples. And those are those those paintings are are done on on the on the rocks which are very similar to granites. Uh, in the in the Bhimbetka, the rock paintings are done on or they are painted on the sandstones. We have we have the rock paintings over here in Andhra Pradesh, in in the Khammam district. They are also painted over over the sandstones. Uh, then in in the Almora, we have we have some rock. Uh, paintings those those are carved on the parts of parts of the higher Himalayas. In Maharashtra, we have some rock shelters in Chandrapur. They are present in in the sandstones. So we have a very very wide spectrum of of the geology, and it it is interesting to see how the civilization or how how those humans they spread across the Indian subcontinent, occupied the sites uh, which have a very vast uh, geomorphological contrast. They occupied the sites which have a great geological contrast, and uh, there are these imprints of of the of the humans uh, on them. So we have we have these these Proterozoic rocks. Then we have we have the Paleozoic rocks, which we call as the Gondwanas. They are present in in the Pranita Godavari. Uh, they are present in the Damodar Valley. Hello. Um, I think there is some. Let me add Dr. Ashwin sign. Dr. Ashwin, are you there? Yeah, he'll just join back in a minute. Uh, there's some interruption in his network. I think I uh, am I audible. I yes, you are. Yeah. Sorry about that. Internet yeah, it's all right. is really okay. Um, so what we were talking about is uh, India is is a land of diverse geology, and we were speaking about about the Deccan traps. Again, we find a lot of lot of stone tools. Uh, there are a lot of sites which have which have helped uh, to understand the human evolution, particularly in in the Deccan Plateau region. So each of this, we have Cenozoic, which are which are laterites, and and there are there are a lot of petroglyphs on on the Konkan coastal belt. All of these, there are caves in in the in the Konkan region. There are shelters. All of these, each of the part of the Indian geology has has some clue on 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 the on the human occupation. They host the sites for the rock art. And it is hence very important to understand this. And whenever we are working in, in, in a particular area, or when we are speaking about, about conservation of the rock art in, in a particular region, it is very important to have a background information on, on what geology we are, we are working on. And what is absolutely lacking, in, in, in particularly in the conservation part, is, is the documentation. And uh, when when we document something, and uh, it's it's the first step in in the conservation, we have to plan the entire strategy based on how we document, and it includes a lot of things. It includes photogrammetry, and it includes includes uh, the the background geological information. It includes the the image interpretation. 
but out of all this out of this this is the first step and geological information uh, is is very important to understand because any decision when we are making uh, many a times in the conservation it is the best strategy is not doing anything and and leave it to be but sometimes we have to intervene and and protect something which is very important so when we are planning to intervene it is very important to understand how the rock is going to behave because there are many cases where where the where the paint is is in excellent condition but the rock underneath it is 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 exfoliating so in that case we don't have to don't have to touch the paint actually we have to we have to look after the rock so that the exfoliation use the the chemicals that we are using for the restoration we we have to have a good information on on how the rock texture is how that rock is going to respond to to the to the chemicals that we are using or how it is going to respond to the conservation strategies each rock has its own response to the climate to the ambient conditions even if we are talking about microclimates the rocks have their their own response and it entirely depends on what is the composition texture and if if there are any structural attributes biological growth when we speak about there are there are fungus there are lichens which grow and and deteriorate the the paints or or you know cover the surface again the rock texture is very important in understanding this this microbial growth and you know planning the strategy to treat this so when we are planning about conservation and when we are planning about preservation rock characteristics is is something which we cannot escape from because these are the surfaces they are always present and and you have to deal with them so it is it is a very important part of the documentation so this is this is the same map which we which we saw but now what what would be interesting is to overlay this on on the geological map of india and see what type of rocks and what type of diversity we are dealing with over here okay so we are we are going to see some of the examples just just for understanding this uh the picture that you are looking on this slide is is from iduki and this is done or this painting is is done on the surface of a rock very similar to granite it is it is charnokite and the painting is done on that what we can see is is a slight bit of exfoliation happening on this then this is a common site and uh, this is this is also there in bimbetka and uh, this is much larger over there but this is a typical site in in the sandstone dominated region particularly in the areas like vindhyas where the fracture planes or the fault planes between the rocks have been enlarged by the ages of erosion and they have been used as as the shelter and what we can see is the water percolating through all of this we can see the staining on the rock surface and this is going to affect if there are any paintings on this okay and now it it is it is very important to understand what surface we have in the background what we can see over here is is the sandstone in the background the pink sandstone that we get at bimbetka the same sandstone continues over here this is again a sandstone and what we can see is is the prominent layering in the sandstone so when when we are dealing with such things uh well the first thing that one can look at is is what structure the rock has or are these are these layerings are having some some effect on on the on the paintings on them okay this is the same thing which we saw previously and and there are exfoliations happening over here uh this is a painting or this is the this is the painting done on the surface of a shale it's a mud rock and a very very fine grained a very very even textured rock and when it comes to the conservation of such things it's the strategy differs drastically um i think we again lost him uh maybe uh, what we can do is uh, yeah i'll ask him that but probably we can also move on to the next presentation and then uh come back to his part later uh hello Sorry yeah hi dr ashwin uh so, also uh, i would actually like to uh, remind you about the time because we have two more 
presentations and also the discussion yeah sure 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 no problem yeah. then we can we can discuss this during the during the discussion part yep thank you thank you very much okay thank you sorry to rush you through. Uh, yeah. okay aparna yes i'm here yeah hi can i just directly share my presentation yes please yes. yeah so let me know when if if there is any problem with the sound yeah. uh, so uh aparna your voice is slightly low can you hold uh, the mic yeah this is closer like mm, yeah kind of okay i'll yeah. Uh, so I'll use my teaching voice. So that will be <laughs> easy. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and thank you, organizers, for putting all these different aspects of rock uh, art together. Uh, I'm going to talk on behalf of a number of people and organizations which function as rock art rock networks. So we are basically biologists looking at rocks as a habitat. So uh, plants, animals that are on there. And increasingly, we have realized that they are shaped and they have been part and parcel of human uh, civilizations for a long time. So we are also trying to understand how humans have interacted with these habitats. Uh, so let me just quickly uh, show you areas that we are dealing with here. Uh, rock outcrops are, are everywhere. So I can't speak about all of them. I've got better colleagues who will talk about it. Uh, my focus has been actually just this little part, the Northern Western Ghat portion of Maharashtra where I've been working. Uh, in India, you get diverse types of outcrops that uh, I have been seeing right now from uh, Ashwin's uh, slides. Uh, a very common one and one where you do find a lot of interesting things are the inzibals, the monolithic uh, granite or these uh, habitats, uh, which is on the right, right hand corner. Uh, what I'm talking about are the lateritic plateaus, uh, which are in more in the uh, you know, Western India, home kind, in um, environment which is very, very harsh. It varies from extremely dry to extremely wet, even today. And their formation is also because of that. So while listening to uh, everybody, I thought that this is the kind of thing that we need to remember of what the outcrops uh, where in the past, how were they formed, what was the environmental context, how it has been changing, because humans have been part of it for quite some time, and how they are now, which could probably inform us about what are the conservation techniques that we need to use. So I'm focusing today on Sada, which is a name given in Marathi or Konkri to the lateritic flat outcrop. Uh, it's a very stark area, and if you look at it, uh, Nobody will be, uh, you know, uh, thinking that this is a highly biodiversity rich habitat, but it is. Uh, one of the site is already a natural heritage site, the Kas Plateau of Sakara. Uh, Konkan plateaus, we are hoping that in future they will be. But biodiversity wise, this is very interesting habitat. This is the summer season and this is the dry season which quickly changes with the onset of monsoon and it becomes extremely wet. So from dry to wet within two weeks, probably, you will have this transformation where everything just changes. And that is an ideal kind of habitat for many of the uh, water dependent species of plants and animals. Then you get a brief period of sometimes around you know, August, September, where you have mass blooming. That's where all the plants come to bloom. The, Habitat which looked almost unproductive, almost arid, turns into completely, you know, highly attractive for different kinds of fauna, productive and beautiful. And then it goes back into its original state at the end of the monsoon. Although in Western India, you will see this because this monsoon, non-monsoon is, uh, you know, the period is really short. But all over India, wherever you have this monsoon, you will see this transformation happening in this habitat. Uh, one of the key features that we have realized from the point of view of uh, biodiversity is that water is a limiting resource here. And considering that we are talking about humans who lived in this habitat, they were almost at that stage in the past where they also must have faced the scarcity of water. So if we have to think about how the humans move, how 
humans use this habitat we have to think about where could they find water and at what point of time and how did they work on that so what we see everywhere is that water although it is scarce humans living in this landscape have found uh, various ways of harvesting water we see indigenous water management practices so from a point where humans were dependent uh, on the habitat to the time when they were modifying the habitat actively to make habitation possible and uh, they obviously understood how water moves in this landscape which makes us makes it possible today for us to figure out probably how they manage this landscape for various purposes of livelihood so the, this is uh, this is from konkan region and it's a very common thing uh, in the western india to find uh, water being managed around the out soil is also a limiting resource so uh, agriculture was not easy definitely here yeah, because um, soil is actively forming so there is uh, there is a ecological process of soil formation by degradation due to lichens and i'm sure that's not going to be very uh, you know good thing for the rock outcrop because they are going to colonize these habitat and eat up the rock and soil is actively forming but it is also getting washed off so you will always have a soil scarcity uh, scarcity of minerals and again people have found ways of making use of that to various means uh, water harvesting and water storage structures are um, traditionally known in the landscape uh, same way uh, and it's also part of culture same way a certain kind of agriculture certain kind of pastoralism has developed and can be seen till today uh, probably something different was there maybe you know in the past but that's something that one can think about what are the things that they were doing there what are the things that they were seeing uh one of the very important things to remember is that this habitat has been stable so we call them as geologically stable old land surfaces which means that they have been uh, hot spots for evolution of plants and animals so you find or increasingly we are finding new species in every taxa from plants like canes to um herpetofauna amphibians uh, everything so that is something very special so you have specialized animals here who have specialized behaviors here so that is something one can remember when we are looking at say rock art and trying to understand what plants and animals are being drawn in this um uh, we also have abundance of certain species which could have been of use as food although it looks like a very stark landscape where people may not have you know it's too dry or whatever but there are times when food is abundant or food has been abundant and that's something one should remember i feel uh what is interesting especially in the konkan is that on one landscape in one habitat we are seeing cultural diversity and cultural practices which are of interest and also biodiversity which is of interest so you find this together and that's why they do hold an hold a heritage value this is from devi hasorban of the i think somebody uh, else had also shown this petroglyph for us as biologists we know it as a place for leptosilia gurneya new species of one little clamshell in water uh so we would like to preserve this as an example of a habitat uh humans have interacted with him that is one very very obvious thing humans are continuing to uh you know trying to organize this landscape and uh, landscape level changes are very very common today and rocks form a great uh medium to quarry and use in your homes so you will find many development processes which start by basically raising the rocks to the ground so quarrying mining and increasingly large development such as this uh, so this is something i think we should talk about i tried to limit myself considering the time but maybe we can discuss more uh, during the discussions thanks for that thank you so much aparna for showing uh... like showing those photos actually and uh, so let's move on to the next presentation dr garge are you there okay. yes yes yeah so 
we can begin with your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers uh, for taking up this topic. Though being basically an architectural university, I have this feeling that too much of prehistory and rock art might be simply out of context. But let me draw your attention that uh, the geoglyphs are part of uh, World Heritage nomination accepted by the UNESCO now. It is on the tentative list. So for all architectural professionals, uh, it is a kind of alarm that now we also need to pay attention beyond uh, built spaces. Uh, I hope I'm uh, audible clearly. Uh, so you're audible, but your slides are not uh, seen on the uh, full screen mode. Okay. Let me share it again. Is it on full screen mode now? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, can you click at the bottom right side, just beside that 100%? Yeah. Okay. No, the other side, just beside that 100% uh, where they have written. Or anyway, slides are visible as such. You can okay. begin it. Uh, sir, you can press F5. F5. I think, has it worked now? Uh, no, we are only seeing the normal mode, uh, the work mode, but this is fine. I mean, uh, the slides are readable, so we can. Uh, Anupam sir, I don't think he's able to see that annotation because probably Karge sir is on the full screen mode. doesn't matter the visual is completely clear let's carry on like that yeah. so the visual is actually completely clear so i don't think we should worry about the full screen mode at this stage. Uh, Anyway, I think. Uh, yeah, slides are perfectly readable, so we can continue. No issues. I'm sorry, I don't know what is the technical glitch, but I'm um, seeing myself on full mode. Anyway, let me continue. If yeah. there's some problem about any slides, please stop and let me know. So, yes, sure. um, again, coming back to the topic of rock art, uh, all uh, previous speakers have put a uh, subject into the correct context by taking a review of geology. Uh, Dr. Watwe uh, spoke about uh, Konkan, Sada, and uh, Pad gave a wonderful uh, review of rock art uh, in general. So, let me come to the subject of rock art in Konkan uh, in specific. The category that uh, we are dealing with for past two three years. Uh, uh, I will not go into what is rock art and petroglyph again, but let me clarify. Uh, we have propagated uh, this particular carving in Konkan as geoglyphs because they are essentially carved on the ground. Uh, nothing is carved on the vertical wall except one. Uh, 
uh, isolated example, which was reported by one of the scholars. Uh, so, uh, if we put this in world context, uh, you know, they are the largest petroglyphs from uh, South America uh, in form of Nazca lines and uh, in number of examples. So, this is a global phenomenon. And uh, this particular place was brought to the notice of department way back in 1990s. But at that point of time, uh, nothing much was done about it. So this is a place called Neuri Fata in Ratnagiri district, uh, where you get to see these kind of carvings. And uh, let me pay tribute to people who have actually worked on it, uh, Dr. Daud Dravi and few more scholars from Konkani Tihas Parishat, then Mr. Satish Lahit, Mr. Ghanekar, from Academia uh, Anita Rani Kothari from Xavier's College, then a team from Deccan College, Dr. Vishwas Gokte, Shikan Pradhan, and Prabhuj Sarvaka uh, were the one who reported this uh, petroglyphs to the Academia. And all of us, we are familiar with work of uh, Nisa Gayatri team, Mr. Rizbo uh, Thakur Desai, sir and Mr. Marathe, and along with them, uh, a young archaeologist, uh, Rutwe Japte. I think they laid a proper foundation of uh, work in Konkan uh, between 1919 and 2015-17. And in 2017, the department initiated a proper drive to document these uh, with the perspective of uh, protection and conservation, along with Nisa Gayatri, which is a Ratnagiri based organization. Uh, sir, you are on which slide? Because we are still seeing the second slide. Mm -hmm. I think. I think, yeah, you should not operate on the full screen mode. You should continue on the normal mode only. So you can see your slides. Uh, I mean, slides are changing in normal mode. Now slides they are changing. changing. I'm flipping now they are slides changing. right now. So yeah, yeah. Now, now they are changing, but for a very long time we were only on slide number two. All right. So I was talking about these peoples, and I guess you did not see any <laughs> visuals, right? Yeah. So is yeah. it is it visible now? Yeah, it's visible. All right. So I won't go to the full screen mode and I'll continue with this. Yeah. And uh, may I also request you considering that the time crunch, I mean, can we kind of jump to the uh, mainly the management and the present uh, ongoing efforts of the government and the management challenges of the this thing? Because it's already 4.30. That's why I would like to request you to okay, fine. go to that part. So people have already spoken about rock art previously in India. And this is the kind of art which we are exposed to uh, for the later date. Uh, so um, these are the sites that we are talking about. A uh, brief uh, survey of how they look like. So this is a figure of Rhino from Deud. Then this is from Chave. And uh, this is Kapadgao. So you can see large fish. And this is classic figure of elephants from Kashari, Rajapur, uh, wherein n number of carvings are seen inside that elephant figure. And, uh, it, you know, the scale is actually mammoth. It is about 16 by 13 meter, making this as one of the largest petroglyphs ever reported uh, from Asia. And uh, what is on there? Here, uh, um, you can see an abstract along with animal figures. This is Devi Hasol. Uh, this is a Basu, um, a classic motif, which again uh, we see from Hadapan context, uh, a man standing along with two um, animals. And these are a few more from Jamhun. Then uh, few more varieties of sea turtle and uh, these are few human figures where you can see evolution and uh, we try to interpret it a bit and the closest correlation is found from Sakha Kombe 
where the symbol is interpreted as uh, fertility goddesses uh, f- fertility goddess which is generally depicted in wali marriages so in terms of classifications you have animal bird aquatic animals and amphibious animals in the human figures and uh, there are certain abstract figures or geometric patterns which are uh, hard to interpret at the moment and a few uh, leaf patterns along with uh, two legs which are interpreted as uh, goddesses and many sites have reported this mycolith usually associated with mesolithic period in india so just to see that context we excavated one of the uh, mesolithic uh, site called koroshi uh, for past two years and uh, Results are uh, still being analyzed, and in future we may take up some kind of uh, site uh, museum at Koroshi. See, what we are trying to do is we are trying to bridge a gap between Stone Age and uh, historical age. And if you look at the rest of the country, uh, the proper uh, transition from Stone Age to historical period via Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Chalcolithic. but if you look at konkan uh, neolithic and chalcolithic are totally absent so um, the path is uh, path had uh, uh, prescribed that we should not attach any of the chrono uh, chronological labels to this but it's it's hard for any archaeologist to skip that and i think uh, as there is no classical representation of chalcolithic or neolithic culture it's a transition of mesolithic phase merging into early historical that is what we are uh, trying to put them tentatively and from uh, government perspective uh, we have uh, proposed uh, protection status for 17 sites out of which uh, we have issued preliminary notifications in case of uh, 10 sites and seven notified uh, sites are almost finalized the final notification is about to be issued and uh, we are trying to take local people into uh, into confidence and nisagayati had uh, helped us in a great manner uh, to establish that dialogue with locals though this is declared as being state protected monument uh, the ownership will remain with the owner himself uh there's the adopt the monument scheme so owner can adopt that monument uh, protected by government and government will spend uh, for maintenance and development on the site and the benefit can go to the local owner that is the basic idea and uh, we have also proposed uh, these figures uh, as part of a uh, world heritage uh what it is uh unesco uh, so uh, we are likely to get it to next year right thank you very much <clears throat> thank you sir for giving that overview and especially highlighting the management challenges so uh can i actually start by asking main, the main question to all of you that what do you and we say that where this study now should actually in which direction this overall study should move uh, and especially from the lens of your own uh, fields so if each of you can give a brief answer about it that where presently the study stands and where you aim to take it dr parth so you are not audible uh meanwhile uh okay uh, dr garri would you like to respond to that i mean based on the ongoing works because you are the most of uh, uh, present, present set of documentation for petroglyphs in konkan is uh, limited and i think we need to expand uh, this in numerical numbers and i think we also need to enhance quality of it 
the quality of documentation and uh, publication, scientific publication, and sharing that data with uh, scholarly community is quite essential. So we have to have some kind of digital platform. And again, uh, awareness drive among the locals uh, for its preservation and sensitization of the same among the other government authorities. And I think if this pattern can be taken to other parts of India, I think uh, we have to have some kind of uh, common place where we can put all the information about rock art, some kind of national inventory of rock art would be a wonderful idea. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dr. Park, Dr. Ashwin, would you also like to share your thoughts? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. So uh, I agree with uh, Tejas. Uh, we need to do the same thing for the paintings. Uh, considering the vast, vastness of the uh, of the evidence spread across you know, the regions, I think we need to have some maybe uh, different uh, chapters or different uh, committees working at a regional level uh, through a network. And maybe we can document them through also uh, including the public, for example, uh, in a lot of this work, uh, especially, for example, through digital documentation that can be done by many people, including students, um, and add that to the national database for comparative purposes and research. Right. Uh, Jigna, do you want to ask something? I think Same after time. everybody responds to him. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would actually like to ask, uh, because Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Riza, Aparna, Dr. Aparna as well, all of you are working either on the region or some of the other sites. So in terms of like presently available research, uh, what are your thoughts where this can go further? Can I start? Uh, so I am intrigued by the diversity of animal figures that are there in the open outcrops. And uh, I have seen only a few because very less has been published. So I've seen it from the uh, resources which are already out there. But it would be interesting to do an entire database and uh, work with the biologists to identify them. Uh, because I saw a lot of theories about how this is this and that is that, but uh, we have very good uh, taxonomists uh, who can talk about what exactly that animal is, what are the features that we must see in that. So if it's a rhino, which species of rhino, if it's a, um, if it's a scorpion, what species of scorpion, how close can we go up to that? That's something that I think can be easily done. And also try to think of distributions of these uh, organisms in say past only 10,000 years because we are talking about a very short period of time. We are not talking about these people seeing fossils of these animals. This is fairly recent in terms of biodiversity. So 10,000, 20,000 years is very less. Like many uh, the major changes in animal distributions have happened only in the past 200 years in India. So we don't need to go to, you know, too far back to try and correlate the distributions. I think that would be worthwhile. Also, uh, there are figures which could be plants. And that's something that uh, I, have, I mean, I've been trying to look to global literature and they discuss very clearly about plants and they have certain figures which could be here. I mean, uh, one needs to look at it in totality and uh, what is the exact figure and what is the symbolic nature of it? Those are two completely different things for which we need to look at existing myths about it or what could have been the myths about it. So these are some of the things I think we should uh, discuss. But for that, we need to have a very clear, very easily accessible database of all these uh, species here represented. Right. Uh, Ashwin, would you also like to share your thoughts? Uh, yes, actually, uh, regarding regarding the petroglyphs particularly, because uh, that is the area which uh, we, we, we have just started working on. And uh, what we are doing is uh, trying to do a little bit of spatial analysis of these petroglyphs. And uh, apart from the normal 
aerial photography we are we are trying to process the images and having a bit of remote sensing approach um what we have what we have found is uh may i share my screen for a minute is it yes sure i'll, I'll just uh, show what is the finding what we have done is uh, this is a this is a this is a petroglyph and uh, local people call it a kite and it has so what we did is is these two are the regular aerial photographs which we took with a drone and these are the processed images what we did is enhanced the the blue band and uh, we and and in these images what is happening is there are features which are not really visible in the regular aerial photography are visible and uh, it it should, it might help in 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 more detailed interpretation of this uh in this in this photograph particularly over here there is a big cement stain and uh, this this petroglyph is damaged because of that so it also helps in in the damage mapping so what i feel here is about the petroglyphs particularly is uh, there is a need to to map there is a need to find a find a damage and i think a, a collaborative effort will will have a good effect on that okay thank you thank you dr abbas are you there yeah uh, as uh, the scholars have already pointed out about the need for scientific documentation and mapping actually uh, it is very much required and it should be inter interdisciplinary and uh, the aim should be to create a comprehensive database which includes uh, all possible uh documentation procedures all possible measures should be taken care of and uh, most importantly most importantly uh, most of the uh, state of art uh, scientific discoveries uh, like uh, infrared thermography digitized microtomography scm all should be employed to understand to have a, uh, some sort of complete understanding of these uh, manifestations and uh, and uh, all the scholars should uh, come together for this cause and share whatever they have discovered whatever they are facing problems they should share and then come to some conclusion that is my view point we lack in uh, we lack in database that is our main point and we don't have proper documentation uh, guidelines we don't have proper documentation procedures and of course like any uh, when it comes to students when they go to field they don't have any training they are not trained at all to tackle various issues which are faced during mapping and documentation this i'm talking about the the students who are doing their dissertations or their uh, phd so doctoral thesis so they should be trained once they before going to the that is important because then we can use their ready made database i'm not talking this like this is uh, for entire subcontinent this is for uh, everywhere if that is available if it is up to the mark then that can uh, that will be a ready made data which can be used uh, for creation of a, a centralized database or yeah thank you so much i think Uh, the need for documentation can't be highlighted more enough. But uh, Dr. Jignal, uh, do you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I thought that the entire presentation was, I mean, the series of presentations, very well curated and uh, very fascinating. And uh, generally, what we, uh, I think, what Dr. Garge pointed out that this may not be. I mean, architects now need to take cognizance of what's going on in this uh, this part of. the research um about heritage or history uh i have always found some very interesting conceptual parallels while we are working in uh, as architects we tend to work uh, in areas where the um, built architecture or the built heritage of the site is um, very evident we don't we consider we do tend to consider anything where we don't find built cities is something that is of importance to archaeologists and something that architects should not get into 
but I've found these kind of really interesting parallels. And I think some of the parallels that came across very strongly were when uh, Parth was presenting about uh, how history could be interpreted, possibly not in terms of categorizations the way we do and the question of decolonization. We have similar uh, dilemmas in our cities that when we are working with our cities, uh, we do have these specific periods that we classify cities in. But uh, when cities as lived in entities, uh, they are never built in such clear classification. So uh, uh, you could find buildings of certain materials and of certain styles, which visually may be classified as a particular period, but they could have been built a little later on because certain knowledge survived, a certain understanding of putting buildings together survived that particular time period. Uh, also that uh, different, uh, the, the behaviors of people and cultures of people are not necessarily divided so clearly in time zones that, that when a particular uh, century turns, uh, people's behaviors don't change. You know, when particular politics changes, people's behavior and cultural practices don't change. And uh, thus these clear classifications is something that we've already always found very problematic. And conceptually I found that, and when I came across this, uh, this, this, uh, 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 these studies that says that maybe multiple human species exist, coexisted, that's a possible, that's a possibility. And then it's, they were not never classified in the, in the way, or they didn't, they need not be classified the way we do. Uh, that those those dilemmas were very kind of cognizable for for me in terms of how we also struggle with our classification of architecture and cities. Similarly, I think you you spoke about uh, what what I found very fascinating that you spoke about that you found that most of the producers of uh, many of the producers of certain kind of art were women and children, and this notion of production of of, of understanding of art and that's a similar uh, discussion that we have in architecture that instead of looking at them as absolute objects or artifacts if we study the processes of production may, or who produced it how did they produce it produce it then the then the notion of what they really mean may change and there i would like to draw a parallel so there are these uh, most of you may uh, would be aware that there are these games found uh, engraved in Hampi monuments. And for a very long period of time, there was a lot of discussion about uh, what those games were. And then uh, those were the games that people of Hampi played. They were there, they're engraved in pavilions, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my students was working on it and he was just mapping these games. And we were just thinking about who would be the scale of the games and how many people would be playing it and so they are simple uh, a crude version of chopal or hopscotch and things like that and uh, there was one possibility that we were discussing that it was possible the, the, when hampi was built was was getting built there was there were these large group of uh, people who were living there to build it and it is possible that, that they build it for their own entertainment because they are not built in a very in very significant places they are not central. They are somewhere in the corner of a pavilion or uh, you know, somewhere on, on one side step. Now, if it was something that was significant, it would occupy a central stage. Or if you say that if a pavilion was made for a game, then it would be central because then people would be sitting around it. So the moment you start looking at these things from those points of view, they may throw up new, uh, new ideas about how, what would be the, what, what would these, these uh, drawings or artifacts or uh, engravings really mean. And of course, you threw the question of ethics and the role of uh, people who inhabit these spaces. Uh, materiality that uh, Dr. Uh, Ashwin threw through. And so I think these are the common dilemmas that we face in the world of architecture. And I think it's high time we start talking. Uh, there, were, there were a couple of things that were that we thought that we could contribute or we could collaborate more, more strongly. I think when Dr. Watwe showed that image of industry uh, and, and it immediately clicked to me that, well, there are certain planning norms that we constantly talk about around heritage sites. And maybe that discussion needs to happen uh, around this and uh, special interpretation, like we were saying, how what what would be the space required to draw something like this? And those interpretations is something that architects 
and people who are trained in spatial understanding can really collaborate and contribute. So these are just ideas that came to me while listening to all of you and uh, it was just extremely fascinating. Thank you, thank you very much. So unfortunately, each of these subjects would, uh, subjects, they need a uh, like very detailed discussion. But uh, I think uh, based on what you just said, can I uh, phrase another question? And that is mainly uh, for Dr. Aparna and Dr. Garge, that how do you see that uh, the existing uh, legal framework for protection of archeological sites and uh, the existing framework for the biodiversity protection, how they can act collectively on ground for better management? I think they just sir can speak first and then I will. So you are on mute. Thank you. If you look at existing legal framework for protection of cultural properties, uh, there is very limited area that we can uh, declare as a protected area. But you know, uh, biodiversity has a larger role to play because this uh, petroglyphs or this uh, this particular type of rock art is embedded in ground. So if you uh, consider its environmental context, I think large area uh, in and around that petroglyph uh, needs to be protected. The existing archaeological act uh, may not be good enough, so we need to act together. So, of course, uh, we had written to the State Biodiversity Board and there's a pos positive response. And I think uh, Dr. Aparna can elaborate about it more. Uh, so, it, this is really one of the most fascinating aspects of the Biological Diversity Act of 2002, that there is a provision for designation of biodiversity heritage site, which includes uh, even things such as uh, geological wonders or uh, anything that has been created in the past or whatever that people feel is of value in their landscape, which could be a socio-ecological uh, you know, feature such as a petroglyph. And I think we should make most use of it because it is one of the most uh, inclusive of the heritage conservation uh, laws of today. Uh, it needs certain modifications for special features, but I think that is something that we should discuss upon. I think, uh, as Jigna might have pointed out, we need to have this discussion, I think, maybe separately and in great details of what is it that we are trying to conserve. Because when we are talking about petroglyph, it's not just that, you know, 10 by 10 meters square, but it's also the landscape in which it was formed also the kind of uh, values that people in the next village associate with it, and also the area where people may have moved in the past. So uh, even if we look at it from a purely functional tourism point of view, what is it that a tourist would like to see? If a petroglyph is surrounded by an industry or a you know, polluting chemical industry, then what, whether the tourist is ever going to come there or get that experience or not, that we have to consider. So therefore, if we are looking at it from the point of view of this, this will be related to the present livelihood. It will change a whole uh, view of looking at that landscape. I think we need to talk about what is it that we are going to conserve as a landscape and the tangible and intangible values that people of past and people of present and people of future are going to hold for it. I think all of you uh, can help uh, help us by looking at the biological diversity acts, this specific provision, biodiversity heritage site provision, and I'm sure that we can find uh, synergy among all of our thoughts because it is really uh, comprehensive. It borrows ideas uh, from uh, UNESCO's mixed heritage site. It adds to it from the Indian view of a landscape, and I think uh, we can make really good conservation efforts out of it. Um, that's from me, but uh, you know, I think designers would be very, very important in this. Yeah. So uh, there was this also um, other aspect of like, as you mentioned, the mixed heritage category. Uh, can any of you would like to elaborate on that? That what are the challenges of actually uh, like getting it inscribed under? Mixed heritage category. I think presently it is only under cultural category. 
true initially this entire project was designed uh, to be uh, proposed under mixed category but you know uh, one has to justify outstanding universal value in both components cultural as well as natural so the cultural sites that uh, we had selected uh, they did not fit the bill for the outstanding universal value of natural sites and uh, if we are uh, going to propose or push the same then the scope was limited to two three sites and uh, so for this time we proposed it under natural category or oh, sorry uh, cultural category and in scope uh, there is always a scope of uh, revised nomination so for now uh, we are thinking of pushing it to uh, cultural category Right. Okay. Aparna, so, would you like to add something more to this? Um, I think what is going to help us more and more is detailed scientific studies from different disciplines, because to argue for a UNESCO's any cultural or mixed or natural heritage site, there has to be backing of good science and good papers. Um, so we hmm. need to work on that. and that can only emerge out of you know uh, teams such as this okay, which later. are uh, able to look at it from different perspectives so that i think is very very important so uh, really i must uh, you know thank the organizers that uh, this has become possible and we should take it ahead as a scientific consortium to look at uh, uh, socio ecological issues such as this Uh, Anupam sir, uh, yes, Pal Pallavi. I think Anupam sir also probably wants to share something. Uh, just just one point. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please. Sorry to interrupt, Doctor Vat. I didn't mean to interrupt anybody. Um, just a few, two things. Uh, the first thing was uh, um, regarding a UNESCO nomination or any nominations. well there is something to be taken up later whenever if it has any value doing a nomination um uh it is really up to us to see the significance of getting a nomination as to how we can then forward link that for something which betters the place but i'm sure we can do something about the not just the preservation but the dissemination of the value and the significance that these sites stand for uh, even without you know getting into that at the beginning what i was also particularly interested in was that this is the first time i'm actually seeing a lot of people come together to talk about uh, the preservation of such sites so it's it's a great initiative on your part um, but when it comes to the technical studies of these sites see obviously there are certain questions you want to be answered so the questions can be related to various sectors that you know you talked about today and then there are the sectors about the material and technology of these sites and the possible physical degradation of these sites or any chemical alterations of these sites or any damages that may occur due to salt efflorescence due to changing water sheds rain fall so it's a very systemic sort of an approach that needs to be taken for it is obviously not just the surface of the it's obviously not just the surface of the site but uh it's also the entire environment around it you know so it's more like a systems approach on looking at this problem but i would say that um um do all these dr garge would be the best person to tell us that whenever there's a rock i've seen rock sites in different parts of india especially the very beautiful ones on the garjan pahad and in the uh, sundargarh and jharsuguda districts of odisha you know 70 feet spans of beautiful uh, ochres and uh, yellow ochres and red ochres and whites and um, do it, does every rock art site the moment it is brought to light does it immediately comes under state protection or are they also unprotected sites uh, not necessarily some of the representative types which uh, represents that particular category the best are brought under protection uh the several uh, criteria why we should protect certain sites and why we should not 
uh, we took a survey of about uh, 92 93 villages out of which uh, the remains or this kind of uh, petroglyphs were found in about uh, 51 villages and some of the best represented types in terms of preservation variety uh, were taken uh, taken up for the protection uh, so each uh, okay will not Please come under uh, each each site will not be declared as uh, automatically protected. declared protected. as nationally just... state protected in my opinion yeah. some of the petroglyphs in konkan should have been a nationally protected monument for example that large elephant that we saw uh, but uh, since no initiative was taken from asi uh, we took uh, the matter ahead so i'm just asking that um, um we'll probably be doing something in uttarakhand but maybe also this part of the world uh, mm -hmm. is there any site which is not of major significance which you can take under your wing and you could make that as a not an experiment but can you make that a study site to bring all these disciplines together so that we have a tangible thing that accrues from this conference of yeah. course just so for so. technical um, studies um, completely non invasive so technical I... studies yeah, so Anupam sir, can I mention that uh, in fact, I sir Mohali and uh, Dr. Path, they have been, they are uh, trying to develop certain programs about experimental archaeology. And uh, I believe some of his students are even already working on these lines. Rajesh and Nokiala, these people are also here. They are focusing presently around Narmada Basin. So maybe similar model can be extended either uh, on the other sites and also as well as in Kok. Spoken. Dr. Path, would you like to share any of those experiences about the experimental archaeology? Yeah, sure. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, first of all, uh, find out the geochemical signatures on the landscape uh, from which these pigments were made. Uh, we also are trying to get permission to collect uh, or sample pigments from the archaeological sites. Um, but again, that is uh, unpredictable uh, from the authority side. But whenever we do get the permission, we plan to correlate or compare the uh, physical properties and chemical properties on a landscape with archaeological signatures, uh, and then see how we can move forward. Uh, as Ashwin was saying, we need to understand the geology and the, how the rocks behave, how the sediments behave, before we can talk about uh, conservation. So we're trying to uh, include all of these aspects, experimental archaeology, uh, geochemistry, uh, surveys of sites. Also, uh, my student Rajesh Pujari is doing a PhD on this, and he's trying to map each site uh, based on the all the natural elements affecting the paintings. Whether the shelter is facing uh, east, for example, when 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 which shelter receives the maximum sunlight, or if any is affected by rainwater, for example. So, trying to uh, look at all these attributes uh, at an individual site level and see which sites need more attention first and which sites are more protected for the long run. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Riza, do you also want to share any of your thoughts? I mean, based on the documentation that you have carried out in different states. Uh, yes. Uh, like based on the documentation that uh, was uh, done by me in the states of Rajasthan, Gujarat, and uh, of course in Goa and in Madhya Pradesh, uh, as uh, Dr. Path rightly pointed out, and even Dr. Pages, that uh, of course uh, the geology part is very important, and the location and the landscape documentation and the study of landscape, because like these landscapes were repeatedly. Uh, visited by these uh, um, people and they have manifested their emotions, their symbology and there was something special in all these because like everywhere you don't find rock art it is only concentrated in, at some specific locations and like as far as the uh, Kungan petroglyphs or geoglyphs are concerned, what I have noticed is that they are special, they are very special because like if you compare the body decorations, the uh, the patterns which are identified, <laughs> they are different actually. They, they, they don't match with the loops, the longes, the zigzags, the, uh, the herringbone patterns, whatever we see in Central India. Uh, 
the decoration part is different here. And uh, like uh, these uh, patterns are basically what, because I have not visited most of the sites in Konkan region, except for the one which are in Sindhu Durga and of course in, in Goa area, that they are made up of only zigzags, some circle and some linear and some tangential patterns. But other patterns like honeycomb pattern, rhombohedral pattern, triangular patterns, uh, which are tessellated uh, and then uh, some sort of design is formed. It is missing. So it means it's a different set of symbology, which we are noticing here in Konkan area. And that needs to be addressed and compared with other parts of India also. And this is the uniqueness that it has a different symbology. Whatever, because I'm, I'm not an expert on Konkan rock art. I've never seen most of the sites, but whatever pictures I have seen, whatever presentations I have seen. So uh, they are different. and it, and what if, like uh, Dr. Tejas, he showed us a, a big elephant. So having lots of other animals also painted in, inside. So like in rock shelters, what we see lots of superimpositions are there because like they, the people, they were having the constraints of his space. But in a lateratic area, in a vast landscape, where there are no constraints of his space, why people were superimposing all these uh, other forms on a larger animal or inside a larger animal. So this is also important. It means that this particular space, these spaces were very important for the prehistoric man for certain reasons. He was uh, coming here, he was manifesting some set of symbols and uh, possibly annually or some occasionally, who knows. So, uh, so that's why landscape study and other sort of like mineralogical study uh, geological studies, they are very important, which makes uh, the study of rock art holistic. Thank you for that. Uh, so actually I would like to, Pallavi, you had a question and I would also like to request others to type their questions in the chat box if they have anything to ask. Uh, I think we will try to conclude everything by 5.30. Sorry for stretching it over, but Pallavi, please ask your question. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for inviting and thanks for this uh, uh, interesting session that we got to listen from different experts who all can contribute in the rock art studies. I just had one or two uh, suggestions maybe or some things which we can uh, take into consideration while we go forward. One was about the documentation and creating the database which we all are emphasizing. I think creating the database is a huge task and a lot of planning needs to go into it right from the beginning as to uh, what is the aim for building the database in the first place because those kind of things really impact the kind of analysis that we can really do or how we can really use that database. So, and of course, we are already understanding the need to create one. So I believe that we really need to do some groundwork there of what do we document, how do we document, and how we basically build the structure of the database. Uh, and second was, uh, uh, while we are talking about rock art, uh, in India, mostly we are seeing two major categories, I would say painting and carving. So maybe from a academic point of view, it would be actually interesting to see how uh, technology, chronology, or uh, contemporary choices or constraints are really working when people are choosing to either paint or carve. So that could be an interesting aspect. Of course, I'm not an expert on rock art. And in Kokan, we are seeing only carvings and not paintings. And then maybe there will be sites where we see only paintings and no carvings. And I'm not sure if we have sites where we see both, but both actually present very different uh, uh, choices and techniques, et cetera. So those could be interesting aspects. And maybe just last one was uh, because Ashwin mentioned about uh, remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing could be a very interesting aspect. And then again, there, what we really want to see in the petroglyphs will drive choices for the imagery and choices for spectral bands, et cetera. So, yeah, but that could be a worth exploring option. Thank you for highlighting that, Pallavi. Uh, any other uh, thoughts, questions? 
so may i take one question uh, like there have been many questions on the youtube as well so uh, but uh, one of uh, shunya has asked that uh, i think we have also been discussing this question that why exactly these day to day representations done by previous uh, human uh, human species why exactly we consider them as art so can uh, any of you throw some light on that that when it gets considered as art and when it gets considered only as depiction is it mainly from present day perspective or whether they had also conceptualized it as art uh well uh in my opinion uh each site is has to be treated differently uh and all the paintings probably and the engravings probably served a different purpose for different populations in time and space uh so we need to approach these things individually even in my area in central india where i work we have a lot of rock shelters uh, which are suitable for painting but they are completely blank um and some rock shelters uh there's overlap of paintings uh from different periods so it's not clear how they chose space uh why they painted but we uh there is a debate about this globally that we call it art but technically it might not be art in the traditional sense for the prehistoric populations uh, and the younger populations but we have to call it art just for academic and communicative purposes but again it would have different functions it could have been uh painted as a memory uh for educational purposes uh again as various uh uh dreams for example they paint dreams in australia so there's a lot of different reasons why these were painted maybe as territorial markers that's why we need to quantify a uh, map and then see what the frequencies are and what the spatial distributions are if if you can get any patterns uh then we can see if we can answer some of these questions but for some sites we will we, we won't be able to i think uh yes stop to signal okay yeah uh, i i was just reminded of uh, there's this um, uh, anthropologists there's an anthropologist who uh, tim in gold who is a scholar from uk he has he works with uh, settlements where he suggests that you uh, look at any production of artifact whether it is a house or whether it is an object and he gives examples from uh, australian um, anthropological studies as well where he says that you look at them from the process of production and identify the um, identify the skill that has gone into it and it is that that will um, give that will lend a more authentic understanding of the meaning of that i use that uh way of looking at architecture also more often than generally architects look at i find that very useful even in that approach even in understanding architecture because that's the same debate uh, that goes on in architecture as well that we today uh, end up labeling a, a architecture of what we call vernacular as valuable uh, today but from from the period that it was built it may not have it may have been a day to day practice and how do you differentiate between what is um, a high heritage and what is vernacular and and that is a discussion that uh, the 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 way of differentiating it is uh, understanding the, uh, the the process of production the skill that has gone into it and the purposefulness of it so there's this framework that i found very useful i'm not sure how it applies i'm sure it directly doesn't apply to uh, to the process of producing uh, rock art but i and as you rightly pointed out every case would be different but i think some of these uh, anthropological understandings may be quite useful in taking this discussion further okay right. So just uh, we also have Sudhir Rizpuri here with us, and he has uh, sent this very valid query. And probably uh, uh, Dr. Garge and uh, even Bharat sir, Path. I mean, most of you who are involved and trying to make these things workable. So he has raised this question of all this discussion that we are doing. This is fine. I mean, this needs to be done. But what about the resources and funding that is required to conduct this? so i think that's that's the major question in front of all of us so would any of you like to say something about it 
and especially he is working on the ground so i'm sure that they are uh, facing a lot of challenges about that as well and even when we take these studies from institutional background also that is one major uh, major thing to take care of so any thoughts uh, uh, see from the conservation perspective definitely uh, money should come from government especially in case of sites which are proposed for the tentative nomination or which are protected as uh, which are uh, protected uh, sites of state archaeology uh, for those sites uh, the funds for conservation and management should come from the government uh, we have already prepared certain estimates which are submitted to government for approval and once that approval is granted uh, the grants and money will flow i'm sure but again research is not uh, i shouldn't be saying primary concern of government but uh, our basic duty is preservation and conservation uh, and of course on in secondary context we do undertake certain research uh, projects but uh, i hope uh, universities come forward uh, they apply for the grants from say uh, various organizations and uh, even uh, some of the grants for uh, research can also be granted by government but one has to design uh, those projects from that perspective i guess and approach the right agencies the indian council of historical research or uh, any any other organization which is providing funding yes sir. in relation to that i would just like to add that uh, they share the news that uh, uh, dr jignath desai and myself and also dr pavin sukumaran who is also in the audience have obtained a grant uh, from dst recently so we'll be working on the documentation of the uh, sites in konkan as well as the paintings in madhya pradesh over the next one or two years so there are uh, funding sources available uh for these projects uh, but they need to be applied uh, strategically uh, and in collaboration with different experts uh, in different disciplines but there the funding is out there but we have to make an effort to uh, apply for it and obtain it mm. yeah very true so uh if in case there are not any other questions uh should okay uh i had a question okay. if possible Uh, if you have yes, time, please. just quickly for, yeah please i think we can we can yeah just uh, for uh, actually is a question for ashwin and maybe even for aparna uh, i was just thinking about uh, the slides you showed aparna about the ecology and the vegetation uh, and also some of the areas were underwater uh, uh, now i'm just wondering on an annual basis with vegetation uh, fluctuating uh, do you think uh, the roots of the vegetation would be affecting these laterite engravings in the long run and would they be getting destroyed or is there anything that we can do to uh, slow down the process or stop the process at some sites uh, especially the root action uh, i'm sure there will be some uh, degradation because of the uh, roots of some of the species uh, although fortunately majority of them are annuals and they would probably just be using the top maybe a few millimeters there are some species especially ficuses or euphorbias which are perennial which root and go deep into the crevices so uh, they are also endemic so from our point of view they also need to be protected but that's something i think uh, needs to be thought of on field how much of intervention needs to be done right now for protection and what can be done but yes they will be leading to degradation uh more than that i i feel uh, the cyano lichens because what has happened now is that you have opened the top vegetation that process had uh, the biological crust had uh, a period had just gone and things uh, had been covering it all the um, you know fine soil and ha- had humus had already uh, formed now that you have opened it and the rock is open the cyano lichens are going to jump in into the niche created because that's their pioneering you know rule how it's going to affect it's very difficult for me to say the it might be very slow but let's look at that so we have a excellent cyano lichen specialist here uh, she had worked on the higher altitude plateau so konkan i think we can ask her to look at it thank you 
Thank you both. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Bharat Sabnes to uh, take the, take up the concluding remarks? Hello. Uh, please tell me whether I'm audible. Uh, yes, you are. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and good evening to all of you. Uh, Dr. Parth, Dr. Tejas, Dr. Aparna, uh, Dr. Riza, and uh, Dr. Ashwin have uh, given a lot of important information about rock art. And I congratulate as well as appreciate their uh, efforts in making many aspects attached with rock art clear to our audience. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, this particular webinar is uh, the initiative taken by CEPT, essentially the university or a center attached with the education pertaining to architecture, uh, especially the efforts of Dr. Jigna and Budula uh, to involve archaeology or to study history of architecture, conservation aspects attached with architectural uh, heritage by considering archaeology as a part of it and various aspects attached with archaeology are studied by this institute in various ways and formats. So this was one such attempt wherein uh, experts from various fields uh, express their views, opinions and study about rock art. Uh, when we try to understand human past from different perspectives, uh, various sources of information are extremely important and rock art is one such topic or one such uh, source of information uh, which is talked about much but studied less and understood very less. So it will not be an exaggeration if we say that uh, rock art in India deserves much attention that, than what it gets today. So this webinar and bringing various experts from different fields working on common area like rock art on one platform uh, will definitely help in better understanding of rock art. And uh, the basic aim is to understand human past and also to work towards conserving, preserving our own heritage uh, for posterity. So in this connection, I appreciate the efforts of all uh, paper presenters and also those who participated in interaction, which uh, generated a lot of good discussion. So right from uh, Dr. Parth, when he mentioned about uh, the need to interpret this rock art with a point of view of the symbolism attached to it, having a proper study on the association with hominid species, especially when he mentioned about uh, the rock art to be studied along with whether these were indigenously indigenous grown ideas or introduced from outside whether these what was the exact condition prior to homo sapiens so when we consider uh, the earliest age of stone tools as around 3.3 million years so in that case where do we stand in terms of rock art so uh, all these aspects connected with anthropology, connected with uh, the prehistoric aspects, uh, such as uh, um, human dispersal, the origin of humans, then anthropological evolution. In this connection, if we try to understand uh, the process, culture as a process, then the rock art uh, needs to be understood in much detailed way. And the, and he has rightly pointed out various issues attached with the rock art research. The major issue was related to what he pointed out was dating and also the superimposition. Many a times superimposition uh, helps us in understanding the chronology, but it also attracts attention that superimposition of various uh, art forms, one above the other, can also lead us to understand the importance of that location, why people are coming and utilizing the same location, especially if we take example of uh, the plateaus of Konkan, then we find at some 
locations there is a superimposition of art uh, forms so the importance of location can also be understood then we need to have a strong database this was uh, discussed at length that we need to have a extensive database of uh, various art forms as pointed out by dr riza uh, it may be pictogram that which is something like applique art or uh, petroglyphs where engraving etching uh, bruising are seen so extensive database of art forms typology then whether there is a regional variation regional variation in painting as well as the rock engravings so this all that can be understood then we can also try to interpret various aspects such as precise function of this or whether there was any symbolic meaning whether it was part of some tradition ritual uh, we need to study a lot and as suggested by dr parth the terminology need to be also uh, it requires lot of attention refinement instead of uh, associating it with the archaeological cultures like uh, mesolithic neolithic chalcolithic especially when there is a absence of associated material to call it a chalcolithic to call it a mesolithic or neolithic it is better to have a terminology which is more precise and uh, especially attached to the typology or the art style so another aspect uh, which was highlighted by dr riza was about uh, understanding the art or the, the human cognitive thought behind this art uh, he rightly defined art as a symbolic communicative behavior of humans so he, if we try to understand rock art which is found all over india may it be in the form of paintings of bimbetka or rock engravings found in coastal areas of konkan kerala uh, at many places we find this uh, uh, that these rock art sites not only uh, gave us various uh, it not only gave us idea about how people tried to express their ideas imagination probably experience experiences from the nature but also uh, helps us in understanding culture development of culture as a process uh, development of human thought and also development of art so uh, may it be uh, as also compared or a comparison was shown by dr riza in terms of art object mobile art objects like ostrich egg shell from patna or a harpoon bone harpoon from belan valley so having comparison with such kind of art patterns and also the, from the discussion it was also brought to our light brought to our notice that there is also continuity of tradition of art which can be very well studied by studying ethnographic or carrying out ethnographic study there are tribes like warli a mention was made to warli tribe then there are tribes like korku santhal munda uh, all these tribes have uh, art tradition attached with their rituals and we have tradition of wall paintings among all many tribals so having this uh, parallels or studying these parallels can definitely help us and the challenges which are there in the research attached to rock art uh, uh, are not only pertaining to only archaeology but there are challenges which are pertaining to geology as well as uh, discussed by dr ashwin that we need to have a different strategy of preservation different strategy of study uh, for rock engravings which are there on laterite surfaces rock paintings which are there on sandstones so similarly uh, in order to have a proper study in order to have a proper strategy of preservation uh, we need to have a very good understanding of local geology landscape because if we right now there was lot of discussion on the rock art of konkan region so there are sites in konkan area where the flat surface of laterite was used for carvings which are now called as geoglyphs uh, and if you see some of the sites especially there is one site 
of rock art in Goa called Pansai Mar, where the river bank uh, or along the river, the laterite surface has carvings more than 100 in numbers. So many such sites need a very good understanding of uh, local geology, sedimentology, and also the effect of uh, various climatic conditions, seasons on the preservation of such uh, rock art. Then uh, the ecological context was highlighted by Dr. Aparna. Uh, a very important aspect because it not only uh, helps us in, uh, in uh, uh, deciphering the past or deciphering these particular uh, rock art, but also helps us in uh, having a proper strategy for preservation, conservation, as well as management of uh, rock art sites. Dr. Tejas, I know, is involved in having a proper administrative setup or contribution from administration towards uh, understanding, then preservation, proper strategy making, and also policy making, which will which can ensure the long life of these rock art. Uh, I'm sure he has uh, also he is also planning to notify some sites in Konkan. Similarly, uh, when I I work for State Department of Archaeology, Government of Goa, so we have sites of rock art which are mostly engravings, uh, and these engravings are located in such areas which are inaccessible during rainy season or sometimes the existing rules and regulations which are generally meant for monuments or structures uh, need to be re-looked at or redrafted uh, for archaeological sites separately than the archaeological monuments. So all these aspects which are connected with administration, connected with policy making, uh, need to be uh, considered and which were rightly pointed out during the discussion which happened here after or and also to suffice everything uh, the discussion which took place after presentation is very healthy and it is going to add a lot of knowledge or going to create a lot of knowledge information about rock art uh, all over india especially uh, the, the sorry inclusion of the Konkan coast or coastal area as a hotspot for rock art sites in the tentative list of world heritage sites by UNESCO. Uh, many such efforts at local level, local administration level, as well as the national level, and also through the world of academics, will ensure that we have a good database. And our strategy for preservation is based upon this database, based upon authentic sources of information and uh, the academic world as well as uh, uh, the administrative setup should work hand in hand. Then only we can ensure the preservation of uh, these rock art sites. Uh, with this, I thank you all for giving me opportunity to interact with you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying uh, for this extended time as well. And I hope in future we can probably plan series of discussions with each of these subtopics. Maybe that will be helpful. And actually, I really want to thank uh, uh, Sudhir Dispur, Rutwej, Rajesh, Tejaswini Pallavi, and all the other experts who took out time and joined us. Anupam sir, thanks to you also for joining. And uh, of course, special thanks to all the subject experts. Uh, and I hope that we can take this discussion beyond this particular panel discussion as well. And maybe sometimes in future, if possible, on the site. Okay, I hope our students also enjoyed this a lot. And uh, yes, with that, uh, thank you. And I think uh, if, yeah. Uh, pa, Dr. Gerge, Jigna, do you want to have any last words? No, I agree with you that we should continue this debate and uh, this discussion and probably have uh, many uh, meetings online uh, specifically to address uh, the key questions raised.
maybe like yes. a make a make it a series and a practical on site yes yeah for that we will need you tejaswini <laughs> sure that's <laughs> Okay, so bye everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riza and Ashwin, for staying for such a long time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sigma. Bye. bye. Thank you.